Part four, tennis ball. The way I understand things, it's like this. We live on a lonely ball called Earth, and humans have basically been throwing it against the wall for so long that the poor old ball is falling apart. It's like me with a tennis ball, chewing away until there's nothing but pieces of slimy rubber that tastes like, well, slimy rubber. And that means there aren't as many places left for wild animals. Seems there are good zoos and bad zoos, and good sanctuaries and bad sanctuaries, just like there are good dog families and bad dog families. The good places are keeping the, are trying to keep wild species healthy and safe. They don't want endangered animals to go away forever. They also don't want the earth to turn into a slimy, del, del, dilapidated tennis ball. Although honestly, slimy rubber doesn't taste half bad. You should try it sometime. The thing is. I would give anything to see my dear pal Ivan deep in the jungles of Africa, where he was born, or to see Ruby running across the savanna with a herd of elephants, her big old ears flapping in the wild. I'd give up a mile-high pile of bacon cheeseburgers to see that happen. I really would, but it but it ain't happening. I get that, and so do they. When you're an animal, it helps. To be a realist. Wow, we're in part two now. Okay, here we go. Dream. This morning, I wake up in my cozy bed, way too early for Julia to make me breakfast. She and her mom and dad are still asleep, and even the guinea, pi pi guinea pigs are silent. My belly grumbles, and once again, I curse my thumblessness. Humans are one big design flaw. They inferior noses. They in inscriptable humdrum rumps and don't get me started on their <clears throat> odor. But the opposable thumb idea, yeah, that was a nice upgrade. The cans, I could open. The doorknobs, I could conquer. Anyway, I feel worried, off. Worry's a waste of time and it doesn't fit with my tough guy act, but sometimes I can't seem to help myself. Before I woke up, I'd been dreaming about Ivan and Ruby and Stella. It wasn't a nice dream, a fun and run toe twitcher. Nope, this one was a nightmare, a bad one. We were swimming, all four of us, in a black, raging river. For some reason, I was in the lead, and I kept looking back, telling them I was going to save them. Me, save them, two elephants and a gorilla. As I paddled like mad. Their voices faded. I looked behind me, and they'd vanished. And then I heard it—a faint bark. That bark. I woke up then, like I always do. I did an all-over shake, trying to toss off the stench of nightmare that clung to me like shampoo after a bath. I told myself to chill, get a grip, stop worrying about nothing. And yet, some primitive part of my brain. The wolf in me, maybe, is on edge. A lot can go wrong in a moment left to chance. The blink of an eye, the bounce of a bone. There are so many ways the world can find to fail you. The smell of a storm. By the time everyone else wakes up, I've I've calmed down, but the wind outside sure hasn't. It's an early fall Saturday, gusty with scraps of sun. Clouds bouncing off each other like bunnies in a basket. Messages on the wind pouring in from everywhere, from dogs making their daily rounds, from feral cats, from anxious raccoons. Basically, everybody is asking the same thing: What is the deal with the weather today? I already know. Weather Channel was on last night with a screen full of big white cotton candy-looking swirls. Julia's dad, George, has already taped up several windows. Sarah, her mom, packed an emergency bag just in case we have to evacuate. Another hur hur hurricane is on its way. Third this season, not as big as the last couple, but slow moving. I've seen the routine, know the ropes. Once breakfast is done, I sit on the couch in the living room, waiting impatiently for Julia to come home so she can take me on our daily stroll. She has a dog walking service, and she's out walking other dogs. I get my own private walk because she's my own private girl. 
I can practically taste the storm coming through the open window. The back of my throat tingle. The metallic edge, the fizzy energy. But it's more than that. It's as if the air is up to no good, sneaking up on the world and looking for trouble. On the poetry of stink. Of course, not everybody can smell what I'm smelling. My nose is a zillion times more powerful than a human's. Dogs are es- experts at odors. Odor. <coughs> Excuse me. Students of stink. We analyze the air the way humans read poetry, searching for invisible truths. And we don't just smell the good and bad stuff that people notice with their uh, substandard snoozes. The usual suspects. Popcorns and li- lilac and freshly sharpened pencils, diapers and Brussels sprouts and freaked out skunks. Nope, our nose get it all. The whole shimmerly double rainbow in April. Humans, they're lucky to get a cloudy day in November. We get the molecules of roast beef dancing on the windy 50 miles from the tidy kitchen where it just slid out of the oven. We get the cherry lollipop under the back seat of Honda 16 cars up on the highway at rush hour. We get things human can't even dream of getting. We're the ones who find the miracle earthquakes, earthquake baby cuddles in her cribs under tons of rubble. We're the ones who find lost hikers in wilderness after a quick whiff of a sweaty sock. We can, we can even tell when someone's sick. We can smell seizures and cancer and migraine headache, headaches, trying getting your guinea pig to do that. We smell feelings too. Sad has a sharp scent with an undertone of sweetness. Sad smells like being lost in a winter forest as the sun goes down. And happy? Happy is the best. But there's a touch of wistfulness around the edges. Happy smells like Bacon ice cream served up in in expensive leather shoes. You're going to love every minute of it, but you know it won't last forever.